Hello. Hi. Welcome to Drinking the Kool-Aid. Welcome. I'm Megan. I'm Hannah. And hopefully y'all had happy holidays, happy days, happy times. Happy, happy. (laughs) The way you said it, you drug it out so much. (laughs) Y'all. (laughs) Y'all. Yeah. Oh, man. And I found today's story by complete accident. Okay. Uh, Those are, like, sometimes the best ones, though. It's so interesting. Um, I was scrolling through, like, books on Amazon, and this one just popped up as a suggestion. So I was like, okay, I'll buy that. And and it was really interesting. That's amazing, because mom actually uh, just asked me, I was telling her um, about one of the gifts I had gotten somebody, and she was like, how do you find things like this? And I was like, actually... (laughs) It's not usually where I start. Yeah. I usually see something and suggested. I click that and then I click the next one and like that one and I and so on. And then all of a sudden I'll find something really cool. Yeah, that's exactly how it works for me, too. Yep. You like go in with one idea and it goes down a completely different rabbit hole. That's exactly what happens. But it can end up really great. It does. (laughs) And so um, this is actually going to be a topic that I have never heard about before. Okay. So I'm kind of pumped. I am too. (laughs) All right. So the book that was so magically suggested for me is called The Strange Case of Dr. Cooney by Don Raffle. Okay. (laughs) Martin Cooney is known as the incubator doctor who was shunned by many doctors, but he never stopped trying to save babies and eventually changed the course of American medical science. Okay. This is going to be cool. Oh, I thought you knew it, and I was going to get really pissed the way you said that. I was like, no way. No, I was like, this is actually, (laughs) this is going to be really freaking cool. It's really fascinating. (laughs) Parents could bring their preemies to a sideshow featured on Coney Island. What the? What? <laughs> okay, like the Coney Island, which is known for death defying roller coasters right. and incubators. <laughs> I did not. Okay. I had never heard of this before. No. Dr. Cooney's story is a mystery. His records are full of inconsistencies, and some are probably clerical errors, but others are just flat lies. His census records start in 1910, and he could have been German or French. All right. He arrived in the U.S. in 1884 when he was about 14 years old, or it could have been 1888. Okay. One of these. Got it. Right, right. Yep. Um, His name at the time was Corsi, like C-O-U-R-S-E-Y. Okay. And then his daughter was listed as his wife. Now, that's uh, not any, right. there wasn't any evidence of something like going on. Yeah, just. It was just listed that way as an error. Okay. His immigration records were missing. And so um, also his naturalization records were too. The New York State Medical Licensing Archive does not have any information on him, and his last name was later changed between Coney, C-O-N-E-Y, and Cooney, C-O-U-N-E-Y. Holy shit. All right. All right. And his funeral was held at Kirschenbaum's Westminster Chapel, which is a Jewish funeral home. Okay. But it was later discovered that his real name was... Michael Cohn, so that's C-O-H-N, not Martin Cooney. Oh my <laughs> freaking frack, I am, Did wow. you follow that? I think so. Cool, can you repeat it back? Fuck no. <laughs> Literally no. Okay. <laughs> God. I, I can't even repeat it back when somebody's like, hey, memorize these like five things really fast and then i'm like by the time they ask me i'm i can only remember the last two yeah yep that's because your brain gets like fried when you hear memorize this it You're does like, ah. immediately <laughs> yeah <laughs> so he claimed to have obtained a european medical license after studying medicine in leipzig and berlin but there aren't any records of oh my this. god 
And he said he studied under Dr. Pierre Constant Boudin, who was considered the founder of modern neonatal medicine. He was researching groundbreaking concepts such as the umbilical cord blood, benefits of breastfeeding, and perinatal care. Holy crap. Mm hmm. Martin Cooney says he was Pierre's intermediary at the 1896 Berlin Great Industrial Exposition, and the two of them exhibited Pierre's child hatchery. Oh, God, that just sounds so weird. The hatchery? Yeah, child hatchery. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't know why, but that, that just <laughs> sounds weird. This is all going to sound a little weird. Um, there's no evidence that the two of them actually knew each other, but Martin Cooney could have made it up altogether, or he might have been, like, a technician at the exhibition. I wish that... I wish that... I had a bottle of alcohol in front of me right now because I would take a shot every time you said, there's no records of this or or. (laughs) Oh, you would be real drunk. I would be wasted (laughs) within a few minutes. Yeah. (laughs) So the one that he claimed he worked with, Pierre, um, his hatchery was used with chickens on farms. So he was not hatching children. Okay. Well, thank you for clarifying. You're welcome. The crowd loved it, but it was never something that he used on humans. The child incubators were exhibited in 1897 at Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee Celebration. Wow. In 1898 at the Trans-Mississippi Exposition in Omaha, Nebraska. And in 1901 at the Buffalo, New York Pan American Exposition. How the fuck (laughs) did you even get through that? I have no idea. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god i kept waiting for it to end and you just kept going <laughs> around 3600 people visited the show on opening day alone martin's medical credentials were made up or self-awarded yet he saved between 6,500 and 7,000 babies over the course of 40 years. That is so many babies. So many. So many lives. Yeah. This is incredible. That's why I was like, oh, we're covering this story. Crowds paid a quarter to see the preemies and parents were never charged a penny for their care. I'm... (laughs) Shit. Yeah. I mean, I it feels weird, like, having crowds see them, but mm-hmm. also, if they're getting free care for their kid, like... Then is it so bad? Right. I don't think so. At one point, Martin Cooney wasn't attracting a lot of attention with the babies, so <laughs> he did a beer advertisement, and it's the worst, but remember, this was very different times, Okay. okay? This was advertised as a special to young mothers, and it read... Oh, geez, I'm so nervous. Quote, Dr. Martin Cooney, the physician in charge of the infant incubators at the exposition, who has had a wide experience, says after using several other beers, we take pleasure in stating we have used Krug cabinet bottled beer constantly and for milk producing qualities. Oof. We can cheerfully recommend it to all nursing mothers. It has less acid in it and it is much more healthful. It is used by every nurse in the infant incubator's building. This is certainly convincing proof and every mother should at least try it. Oof. Um. Yep. Yeah, there was a lot of things wrong with that. So many, but again, it was different times. It was. It was. Um, I'm not sure how much they knew about it at the time. Clearly, not a lot. Uh, and he may have endorsed this, but he never actually allowed his nurses to drink any alcohol. So he had to have known that it was a problem. Okay. But somehow, or was just this, nervous about. It. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Somehow, it's still gotten endorsed. I don't know. The author of the book, Don Raffles, said, quote, Hospitals were under-resourced. There was a high rate of infant mortality. Women were dying in childbirth, and he was working in the shadow of eugenics, which was beginning to rear its head. Eugenics was the pseudoscience of improving the human race by breeding out undesirable characteristics. Okay. 
Eugenics is also referred to as racial hygiene, and it was a movement during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Oh. Um, it's basically, it's the selection of desired characteristics in yeah. order to improve future generations. Yep. Um, so it's real gross. I'm you, glad you explained it, though, because yeah. I was about to ask what the fuck that was. <laughs> yeah, um, you would basically reduce so this is the thought is you would reduce disease disabilities or so-called undesirable characteristics yep. in the human population early on it was believed that people inherited mental illness criminal tendencies or even poverty and that it could be bred out of the gene pool well yeah <laughs> yeah um not quite Right. No. I think we were wrong on that. Not quite. <laughs> Eugenics encouraged healthy people to reproduce, and anybody that was deemed to have anything outside of the, quote, norm should not god, reproduce. That is so fucked. Oh, God. I uh -huh. hate it so much. This uh. idea is typically associated with Adolf Hitler, but it was also oh, being great. used with babies. Even better. Uh huh. If a baby was born premature, it was believed that they were too weak. Oh, my God. Uh-huh. And this is why I actually wanted to do this story is because I find this so interesting. So Preemies are some of the strongest fucking babies out there. Of course. But at the time, they didn't know. So hospitals actually would just let them die. <gasps> yep. That was apparently a thing. Um... I know. I yeah. Figured that. I mean, I think I. It's shocking. Knew that's where it was going, but I don't yeah. think my brain actually believed it. Right. And, and then, oh, that you that's said what it? they were doing. That was the practice. Oh man. The knowledge, expertise, and technology necessary to help the infants just was not available. Preemies who survived more than a day or two were labeled quote weaklings. Because they were genetically oh inferior God. and the survival rate was low. No. By 1910, there were better baby contests that were happening all over the country. I'm sorry, what? Better baby contests. You know. <laughs> no, I don't actually. <laughs> well. <laughs> I have zero clue. Okay. Zero. Prizes were being awarded to babies for having, like, the best-shaped eyes or noses. Oh, my God. <laughs> babies that were the cutest were celebrated, while the weak or disabled <gasps> were tossed no. to the side to die. Oh. It's not good here, okay? Do you remember, um, like, 30 seconds ago when I said I know zero about it? Uh-huh. Yeah, let's rewind back to that. <laughs> and erase it all. Gone. <laughs> I swear there's going to be a good part to this story, okay? Mm. I'm telling you. All right. The eugenics movement wasn't meant to specifically target preemies, but the idea was certainly applied. Dr. Cooney had a different vision. He didn't like this. He didn't care what a baby's background was, what their race was, or even if they came from a poor or wealthy household. Yes. He felt every baby deserved a chance to live. Yes. And so he wrote a slogan that was on every door of his show, and it said, All the world loves a baby. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's actually really cute, okay? That's adorable. Um, and now, he got into all of this before his daughter was born, so this is just kind of an odd little fact that his own daughter ended up being six weeks early. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And so when this happened, when she was born, he sent a friend of his to go fetch an incubator from Coney Island, and that was an hour drive each way. When the baby was born, Martin plunged her into ice cold water to shock her into breathing. And then um, her name was Hildegard, and she was raised mainly by her Aunt Louise, who was a nurse who worked for Martin. And nobody filed her birth certificate in, until 1926, and she was born in 1907. So that could explain... Why she's listed as his wife instead. Yes, yep. exactly. Martin was wildly 
advanced, like decades ahead of the medical establishment. Each incubator was more than five feet tall, made of steel and glass, and stood on legs. A water boiler was on the outside, and that supplied the hot water to a pipe running underneath a bed of fine mesh where the baby slept and a thermostat regulated the temperature. Can you believe that? Like, it's so good. (laughs) That is so cool. Yeah. Another pipe carried fresh air from outside the building into the incubator, first passing through absorbent wool suspended in antiseptic or medicated water. Then it went through dry wool to filter out the impurities. Yo! (laughs) This dude! I know. On top, a chimney-like device with a revolving fan blew the exhausted air upwards and out of the incubators. This is crazy. So it's like he's figuring this shit out. You know, the hospitals haven't, but okay. In 1903, it cost about $15 a day to care for each baby in Martin Cooney's facility. So when I looked that up, it's a little over $500 today. Yeah, that would be rough. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, when you're doing that on a daily basis, like, that's crazy. And especially because a lot of preemies are in there for months. Mm -hmm. 500 freaking dollars a day would take you down so fast. Exactly. And he's not charging any of the parents. Right. He gave many speeches to advocate for saving the lives of premature babies, and he recited the names of men who were born early and lived to achieve great things, such as Mark Twain, Napoleon, Victor Hugo, Charles Darwin, and Sir Isaac Newton. Holy crap. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, you're just teaching me all sorts of things today. (laughs) He maintained his facility at Coney Island for 40 years and also set up a similar one in Atlantic City. And that was in 1905, and it ran until 1943. Wow. hmm So a long time. Through the years, he took his show to other amusement parks and to world's fairs and expositions across America. He insisted on feeding the babies breast milk and paid wet nurses to feed them on a constant schedule. Wow, this is incredible. I know there's so much thought and detail. In everything that he did. There are testimonies from doctors who worked with him, and they said that they had never seen a hospital as calm as the one that was in the sideshows. Some of the babies in Martin's care didn't make it, but the survival rate was somewhere between like 85 to 90 percent. Okay, and which like, is incredible. Again, and those kids would have just been tossed, tossed aside, aside. So yeah, and not given a chance. Any of them that he can save is a huge mm-hmm. miracle. Exactly. Most babies stayed in the show for a few months and they were allowed to be discharged once they weighed five pounds. And then the patients would receive a diploma that read, quote, This is to certify that baby received its start in life at the Baby Incubators Institution at the New York World's Fair. We, the undersigned, are proud and happy to present this certificate to the above-named baby with our best wishes for its continued good health and success in life. Okay, that's super sweet. I know they get a little diploma. (laughs) Martin Cooney used a very different approach than others. Doctors were masked and gloved at hospitals and had a no-touch protocol when it came to the preemies. Most doctors believe that there shouldn't be any contact with premature babies because there's a risk of infection. So sad. But Martin was like, ah, hell no. He encouraged his nurses to take the babies out of the incubators and hug and kiss them. Because he could see that they responded to affection. Yeah. (laughs) Imagine that. (laughs) When a baby arrived, they were bathed in cyanized water and mustard. There Uh, wasn't an explanation for this in the book. Okay. But I did a Google search, which says that, like, a mustard bath can soothe muscle aches and detoxify the body. So I kind of think that's what they were going for. Really give a fuck how sore my muscles are. I am never, never 
doing that. Well, yeah, and mustard makes me gag. So That's disgusting, no. dude. <laughs> I mean, I get it. I get it. But like, oh. Yeah. So I guess, you know, they start off by detoxifying them. And then if the baby could swallow, they got two drops of brandy. Then they were rubbed with alcohol, swaddled tight, given a pink or blue ribbon, and placed in an incubator that was kept around 96 degrees. Wow. Mm -hmm. Interesting method, but all right. (laughs) The babies were given show names for confidentiality, and then every two hours, they were fed by a wet nurse. Damn, he thinks of everything, even giving them, like, show names? Uh Uh-huh. Holy shit. I know. Because at first, like, when they said they got a different name, I was like, why? But, yeah, oh, yeah that makes sense. Yeah. hmm If a preemie was born in the summer, then they could be featured in the sideshow. But if they were born in the winter, they were kind of out of luck. Oh, that is unfortunate. Because then you're stuck with the hospital. Yeah. You know? Martin Cooney desperately wanted to change this, but he was having a difficult time with the funds. In 1909, he held a competition for the best preemie. More than 500 babies had passed through the incubators by this time. Families from all over arrived with their children, and they were dressed to the nines. The judges selected three-year-old Burton Douglas Stevens as the healthiest and best developed. So he was presented with a red wagon as his prize. Martin used this opportunity to mention that he wanted to set up a permanent incubator station in Chicago, but he needed the government help to make this happen. Physicians and health officials kind of hated Dr. Cooney. Oh, what? And they felt like he was exploiting babies and endangering their lives by putting them on display. I'm sorry, endangering their lives Uh by saving thousands of them when you fucking set them aside? It's like anything that's different. People just won't look at it. Okay. Okay. So they regularly tried to get him shut down. Nope, I'm not calm. Never mind. (laughs) They were after him. (laughs) Even though it was referred to as a sideshow for the preemies, Martin did try to distance himself from, like, the freak show aspect of it. Yeah. That's what had me in the beginning. But now Mm -hmm. that I've heard all this, I'm like, nope. Right. Exactly. He really stressed that the preemies were in a miniature hospital, not a sideshow attraction. And he dressed his nurses in white uniforms. And then the doctors wore suits that were topped with white physicians' coats. The facility was always scrubbed spotless, and he hired a cook to prepare meals for all the wet nurses. Oh, a dude thinks of freaking everything. I know. Everything. <laughs> yeah. Now, if any of them were caught smoking, drinking alcohol, or even, like, snacking on a hot dog, they were immediately fired. They had to eat healthy. Oh. Oh, because they're... They're feeding the babies. I get it. So it it makes sense. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. It was Memorial Day weekend, and only a few people were awake at Dreamland, which is an amusement park at Coney Island. A worker knocked over a bucket of tar, and it hit the lights. You're freaking me out, (laughs) Megan. Ah! And it sizzled, and... Hellgate burst into flames. She's like, of God. all things, okay. I was like, oh gosh. Yep. All right. The breeze carried the flames quickly, and the fire was heading straight for the incubators. The New York Times reported that all of the babies had died, but they didn't. What? Yeah. So that night, the wet nurse was just getting up at 2 a.m. for the next feeding, and a police sergeant came rushing through the door, followed by smoke. The doctor grabbed two babies and covered their heads in blankets, and the nurses each grabbed a baby, and they all took off running. They had five babies at the time, and they all survived. Why the hell would they say that they all died? Well, the paper reported that three babies were carried out but suffocated, and at least three other infants had been trapped inside. Because they're trying to make them look bad. Well, I think that it was a combination of things because they didn't know where the babies ended up, so they just assumed they had all perished. And, yeah, I think that everyone was after them. So it was like, oh, here's this headline. And so then the next day, they had to run a correction, and it just said, 
all well with the babies. Can you imagine? Like, thinking that they all died? Th- that's so tragic. And then the next day, they're like, psych? Yeah. Oh, well. Oh, okay. Perfect. (laughs) The five babies had been rushed to the home of a doctor named John Pierce, and the nurses continued their feedings and care on schedule. Everything was business as usual. Beautiful. When the false story was originally printed, though, it did ignite outrage. John D. Lindsay, the president of the New York Society of Prevention of Cruelty to Children, sent an angry letter to the editor, stating this violated every principle of medical or professional ethics. He said the society had previously investigated the incubators and attempted to have them shut down in 1906, and this work should only be conducted in hospitals. So it's like this was proof. Of why it should shut down. But, like... It's not true, but... Yeah, yeah. and why are they... Yeah. I, I know. Uh, they just latched onto it. The problem was, not only were incubators not being used in hospitals, but pregnant women didn't even want to give birth in a hospital because the protocol was extremely harsh. Um, According to the book, kerosene and ether would be applied to the woman's head, and her hair was washed with ammonia, and then it was braided. Her nipples were cleaned with ether and albaline, and then her pubic hair was shaved or clipped after giving birth. Um, Or it was clipped, and then after giving birth, she had to lie flat for 24 hours and was not allowed to sit up for the first five days. Oh, my. Then she was only able to consume milk, no food, for the first oh, two no. days. Oh, no. Yeah. Um. Oh, so, no. The lack of nutrients after giving birth. Oh, my God. Right. I'm, I mean, we know a lot of people used to die after childbirth, like, a significant amount. Frick. And I'm sure this adds to that, you know? Yeah. Like, this is crazy. Some of the children that were preemies came from poor families, so when the show was over, nobody came to claim them. Oh, no. And then they would end up being sent to an orphanage. At one point, Martin wanted to donate the incubators to the city when the, uh, when the San Francisco show ended in December of 1915, but he literally couldn't give them away. Nobody wanted them. This is crazy. Yeah. And he didn't want to tear down a fully equipped facility that could save lives. You know what some hospitals would give Mm -hmm. nowadays to to have have free incubators? Holy shit. yeah. Yeah. They're so expensive. But he received memos saying that the building was going to be demolished because it was sitting on private property and the owner wanted it back. Of course. Mm -hmm. There were also rumors that Martin was making money off rehoming the children that weren't claimed at the end of the season. Someone didn't claim their baby, and instead of sending them to an orphanage, he found a family to take them instead. Like, oh, no. Right. I mean... And so awful of him. There's not any proof of this. He saved their like, lives. How dare he? Exactly. I just don't see... I mean, I'm, I know that there's, like, a proper protocol, but also nobody wanted the kids right and it, it's so i just don't get it yeah and I, I i if he found a good home man pff. yeah and shit if he's making money it's probably to go towards his facility that's exactly right that he's not charging these families right for. exactly so i don't know he did run into a little trouble with the irs because he was filing as a personal service corporation which is a charity even though he charged admission to view the babies. He never sent a bill for his patients, but the IRS did not agree with this, and so he took the case to the U.S. Board of Tax Appeals, and the board ruled against him, and they made him pay up. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. God, why are everybody such assholes? I know, he's just getting it at every angle. I mean, come on. Later on, there was an infant incubator reunion, which was broadcast live. Prominent doctors and members of the Infant Aid Society showed up to watch, and the speech kicked off with, 
All the world loves a baby. Julius Hess was an American physician who is often considered as the father of American neonatology. He published the first textbook in 1922, which focuses on the care of prematurity and birth defects in infants. Julius Hess attended the event and was also a speaker, and he said, quote, I should like to emphasize the fact that we believe that those premature infants who have normal psychological development for their fetal age and show no inherited disease do not differ significantly as they grow older in weight or in mental development from their brothers or sisters or from other children. Correct. He said this is a perfect example of why he needed assistance from a showman. Martin was thrilled to have 40 of his preemie graduates attending the show. And he okay, was, see, I was going to actually ask uh-huh. you if, they were, if some of them were going to be oh, there. Oh, yeah. And he was equally happy with the leading doctors, quote, who have come here for the purpose of convincing themselves that these babies are actually worth saving. Because they are. Of course. Just throwing course that out they there. Are. Martin struggled to get people to accept his skills in caring for preemies. He eventually got Julius Hess and Morris Fishbein on board. Even though he had well-known physicians endorsing him in New York and the American Medical Association had honored him with a platinum watch, of all things. <laughs> that is random, but all right. Um, people only saw him as an amusement man. That really is unfortunate. It is. It, it's hard to break away from that identity. Yep. In 1937, he expressed interest in exhibiting um, and he found doctors that were willing to take over the project if he passed away because he was about 70 at this time. But he's still chugging. still kicking. And I mean, and he's he's over there still fucking getting things lined up and having uh-huh. thinking of everything. Exactly. Good and making God. sure that his, you know, legacy of saving them is going to continue. That's amazing. One committee member objected to the exhibit, and Martin still had another issue to deal with, and that was money. He wanted this show to be bigger, grander, and he was going to finance it by himself. After the fair, he planned to give the equipment to the city of New York for a permanent hospital. Unfortunately, Martin was never the best at finances. He originally estimated that he would need about $80,000, but the amount soon jumped to $100,000. That's how it works. Uh Uh-huh. And the committee sent Martin a request for his financial report because they were like, okay, where is all this money coming from? But he didn't have time for that, so he just ignored it. (laughs) The committee attempted to fish for more information on their own, so they went and visited local banks, who all confirmed that Martin did not borrow any money from them. Ruh-roh. The committee was like, okay, this must mean that he has enough liquid assets, but they were wrong. Unfortunately, like, he was way over budget. Oh, God, okay. Skidmore and Owings was hired to design the building. In addition to the nursery, there would be a U-shaped structure with nine rooms so that Martin, his nurses, the wet nurses, housekeeper, and chauffeur had living quarters. There would be a garden and a glass bricked area where the babies who gained enough weight could be in the sunlight. So it would be like a presentation room. It's such a cool thought. To I know. love where he's going with this. Yes. Um, and it could also be used as like a doctor's visiting room, too. They were behind schedule on the project, and Martin had to sell stocks so that he could afford the labor, but it was a bad market. He tried to get around everything, and he was cutting corners and even got upset about the fire alarm requirement. He had a close call years earlier when there was a fire and he had to get the babies out in time, you know? Yep. Um, But he just couldn't afford another dime. So, I mean, I get it. Each thing costs something. It does, yeah. It's like you think you got everything and then you realize there's 10 more things you never even got to. Right. 
And he's like, well, you know, we saved him the first time, so we can do it again. Oh, no, no. That's, <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, okay. Let's not push our luck. <laughs> well, he typed up a two-page letter arguing that a fire alarm was, quote, absolutely unnecessary. He said the building was semi-fireproof. He had six extinguishers and a hose reel connection inside. Three or four nurses were always awake, and they had a telephone with four extensions. They had nightly fire drills and set up baskets with hot water bottles and blankets in case they needed to evacuate. He also had a special ambulance that was parked nearby, and he always slept on the premises. Okay, actually, though, that is a lot of things to put into place. It it is. And he wrote, (laughs) this is what he put in his conclusion, quote, My nurses are strictly prohibited to smoke in the building, and my babies do not play with matches. I hope you will see the justice of my claim and relieve me of this unnecessary expense. (laughs) My babies do not play with matches. I was not. Yeah, I did not know that that's what you were going to say. Holy shit. Uh, yeah that's a great point Uh uh-huh i i really hope your babies don't play with matches uh because if they do Mm -hmm. i'm very concerned then we've got a different problem yeah all together a whole (laughs) nother problem right right okay so i'm gonna try really hard to say this correctly um when they first discovered retrolental fibroplasia Martin said that he just didn't understand it because he took care of thousands of babies and none of his babies ever went blind later in life. He didn't live to see the answer, but this was solved. His machines did not have enough oxygen to do this kind of damage, especially when the nurses were taking them out on such a consistent basis. So this was something that happened to preemies that were in the hospital. Oh. hmm Martin gave everything he had to saving the babies, and there was nothing left for him financially. He did receive some checks in the mail from Julius Hess or Thurman Guyven or other medical friends that could afford to send him those kinds of gifts. Right. In 1943... Cornwell New York Hospital opened the city's first dedicated premature infant station, and that was the year that Martin Cooney closed his show for the final time because his work was done. Oh my god, you just gave me chills, man. (laughs) I got the goosebumps. Uh, I got them. He died on March 1st of 1950, and he was buried with his wife, May, at Cypress Hills Cemetery in Brooklyn. Record keeping was shoddy, so we don't have an exact number, but it is estimated that Martin did save between 6,500 and 7,000 babies. That is just so many. I know. But, like, there's nothing indicating this at his grave, which I find kind of interesting because this is such significant work. Yeah, that's true, but also with so many people. Mm Mm-hmm. Going after him right. for it. Maybe it was a situation that was just, like, not the best idea. Maybe. To keep people away from him, at least, you know what I mean? Sure, sure, yeah. Dr. Julius Hess continued the fight for preemies until his death in 1955. And Martin's daughter, Hildegard, continued to work as a nurse until her death in 1956. Oh, I love that. Mm-hmm. Well, not that she died, but that no, she No, that she was a nurse. a nurse. Like, that's so cool. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> yeah, I love that. <laughs> oh, yikes. Oh, no. My bad. <laughs> the records about the incubator babies were not great either. In fact, some of them wanted to meet the others, like, once they were adults, but they had a difficult time finding anything. There were a few that were discussed in the book. Harold S. Musselwhite Jr. wrote a letter to the research librarian at the New York Public Library dated Thursday, June 27, 1996, and he requested any possible information about Martin Cooney, including his obituary. 
Okay, but how cool is it Mm -hmm. that the kids that he saved... Right. Like, some of them grew up... To be adults like and, the, and then long. wanted to also connect with the others yeah and find out more info on him because you know he they were saved by him exactly they would not have most likely had a life had it not been for him oh it's so cool um so he actually wrote a second letter on june 6th of 1998 where he provided some details about his life he was born in brooklyn on April 24th, 1921, and the letter said, quote, My parents and several others were preparing to go to the Statue of Liberty when my mother paused to go to the bathroom. She suddenly called out, The baby's here! And I was safe from going down the toilet. Oh my... Okay, <laughs> all right. That is a great way to start that out. It was my maternal grandmother who conceived the idea of keeping me in a cotton-filled shoebox placed in a warm oven as a makeshift incubator until they made contact with Dr. Cooney. So terrifying, but Uh I get it. It was the time. No hospital had the means to care for me. The how and when is unknown to me, as was my means of transportation to Coney Island. Unfortunately, all persons concerned are now deceased and most of the records destroyed. Harold was also looking to connect with his other incubator mates. He had lived a fulfilling life. He was married, had three children, and seven grandchildren, but he always felt like something was missing. He passed away at age 83. Holy crap. (laughs) So, I mean, come on. And it looks like he was never able to locate any of the people that were in the incubators at the same time. So that's kind of a bummer. Yeah. June and Jean were incubator twins who also wanted to know if there were other incubator mates out there. They tried writing to several media outlets, but nobody responded. They didn't want the story. Yep. The twins were born on August 17th, 1934, and they weighed a combined total of 7 pounds, 10 ounces. Oh, my God. That is so all oh, super man. tiny, like healthy for a yeah. regular, like one baby. Right. But two, ooh. Their aunt was a nurse, and so she got them into the show. Their father stopped at the fair daily on his way to work, and he would deliver his wife's breast milk to the nursery next door. There was also a four year old boy who would visit the babies, and he later became Jean's husband. Oh my God. So, like, how weird is okay, that? That is cool. <laughs> like, this whole story, man. And then 19 years later, Jean and June had a double wedding. Oh, mm-hmm. Shut up. That's awesome. Yep. <laughs> Uh, Another one was Beth Bernstein weighed one pound, 10 ounces when she was born in 1941. Oh, that is just bananas to Mm -hmm. hear in 1941 that, like, he was able to help make make it so she was able to survive. Yeah. Wow. Now, she did have a twin who, unfortunately, only lived for two days. And she never knew about her until she overheard her family talking about it when she was 11 years old. So Beth asked her father about this, and he confirmed that, yeah, she did have a twin, but she was not allowed to talk about it in front of her mother because it was just too painful. Rough topic, yeah. Yeah, so it was kind of like a family secret. The couple never had any other children, and they were very overly protective of Beth. Yeah. When she came home from the incubator, her mom wanted to get a nurse for her because she was, like, really, really scared. And Martin Cooney told her, no, no. He said, you've already had a long vacation. You need to take care of your child. Oh, my God. (laughs) He was like, no, this is your time. You've got this. You can do it. On the day of Beth's birth, her mother called the doctor because she knew that something was wrong. The hospital did not have anybody trained in treating a baby that was under two pounds, and they didn't have the machines to keep the baby for long. The doctors wanted to send Beth to Dr. Cooney, but her mom got really upset because she was like, my baby is not a freak. Yeah. She didn't want her in a sideshow, but they got Martin Cooney to persuade her himself. Oh? Mm Mm-hmm. 
Her mother couldn't bear to visit her while she was in the show, but her cousins went to Coney Island every day to check on her. Many people chastised Beth's mother for putting her child on display. And so this made her feel like really embarrassed and ashamed, yeah. but she was trying to give her kid a chance at chance. life. It's the best chance. Yeah, yeah, and the only chance. I mean, truly. The last baby homecoming was held in 1940 at the World of Tomorrow, and it was for the class of 39. It came with stories of everyone saying that they weren't supposed to be alive. The doctors gave up on them. Their You're parents... giving me chills again. <laughs> <laughs> Their parents were told that they wouldn't make it. Martin was the only one that gave them a chance. Some of them had been rushed to the sideshow in a warm towel or in a shoebox. Martin may have been a very controversial figure who wasn't even a licensed doctor, but he's also someone who put everything into changing the world and saving children again does it even matter if he was a licensed doctor not because to me yeah i mean look how many lives he saved when you look so, at his work it doesn't matter no i mean like now obviously but it's an entirely different mm -hmm. story you know yeah. now yeah exactly it's just like you know if you've got somebody there that's willing to put everything on the line to save these babies i think that's incredible no absolutely you completely know? agree Dude. I know. Wasn't that cool? That was a really, that was a really, really cool one. Yeah, I like that. I never had an intention of using this for the podcast, but like I started reading the book and when I got, you know, a few chapters in, I was like, no way. This and why has the fuck to be not? featured. Yeah. I don't know because at first it didn't really feel like um, a true crime story, I yeah, guess. But yeah. But it is, because and, babies were dying. But technically speaking, we're not just true crime, so it we're can be anything. Any weird stuff yeah. we want. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, I just... So I would not be mad if you did another, like, something like this. Yeah. This is really cool. Well, and it's stuff that I had never heard about. No, I haven't either. It's so cool. No, I never have either. And I just think that, you know, sometimes anything that is perceived as, you know, strange or unusual... Everyone wants to shun that person. Yep. And it's ridiculous because look how much good he did. It's incredible. Well, a lot of weird people do good. Exactly. Yep. They sure do. Like, come on. I'm a weird people. What have you done this good? <laughs> hey, I didn't say that I did anything good. I just said I'm a weird people. That's true. Yeah. We both are weird people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So make sure to... Follow us on any of your podcast apps. Tell us the stories you want to hear. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Leave us a five-star review if you love us. Tell your friends. Tell your cats. Um, Bye. bye.